Okay. Um, so I'll start off, you might wonder where I'm going with this, but I have to start off with the first slide. Oops. Um, so the beginning was crisis. <laughs> um, I'd finished my PhD and I did my PhD on the topic I love. It was clubbing, um, it was psychology. And then I tried to publish the first time round and it was a two sentence feedback. Worst undergraduate writing I've ever seen. How dare you? I thought, no, 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 I won't be defeated. Um, I submitted a proposal to an editor who was um, looking into editing a book. And I had told them of, about my previous experience and they had said, uh, don't worry, don't worry, we have two experienced editors here, we write this with you, you know. I thought, good, I'm in, I'm in capable hands. I, th I think when I did my PhD, I was quite guarded and protected and very well looked after. And then halfway through this process, I got an email uh, saying, uh, with one editor leaving out of the two, we can't help you anymore, goodbye. <laughs> um, and so my first crisis in academia was basically a year in, <laughs> and I thought, is this for me? I'm not sure anymore. So I had to ask myself what I really like, and if this is conducive to any higher ed education institution. So. Um, and, and, I've, and I've realized I, I do live and breathe electronic dance music. This is what I want to study. Um, I'm interested particularly in Britain and rave culture and its public perception. And I thought, I still want to publish something from my PhD. This is what I'm doing this thing for. And I had data from real people. So as part of my PhD, I interviewed, I interviewed people, we had focus groups and there were themes that kind of came out of this research. So in the public sphere, rave culture is portrayed as being apolitical. What I found in these interviews is that it's a very political culture. Um, these people are usually portrayed as, as purely hedonistic. What I found is that th participating in this culture was very meaningful for people in many different ways. Um, just as kind of youth cultural research has developed, I found that you know it's no longer strictly speaking a youth culture. We are talking about aging youth cultures, and this has impact on the on the people who I interviewed. Um, and also in the public domain, it's usually known as a drug culture, um, but club culture has so much more to offer. So I thought, okay, <laughs> I'm no further with my publications. But then. Um, uh, I think it was in 2015 that Manchester for the first time took part in the ESRC Manchester Festival of Social Sciences. And um, budget was devolved to the different universities and we could apply to propose a project. And I thought, this will be my final shot <laughs> before I retire. <laughs> so I met a friend for a pint and we said, we're going to do a rave. <laughs> and of course that doesn't work. So, but we did sit down, it was just a joke, not the pint, but the rave. So we did sit down and, um, and discussed what it actually is that I want to find out in my future research, because you don't just want to do projects that don't inform your research narrative. And uh, those were the questions that I wanted answering in any project that I'm doing in the future. How is meaning produced through dance? What has become of the generation of ravers who were interviewed back in my PhD times? Do aging ravers still engage with the current electronic dance music culture? What are their values and how can I engage the public and make data speak for itself since I'm clearly incapable of writing <laughs> papers? Um, and so this is what I got back. I set up a Facebook group because that was back then my, my kind of dominant mode of communication. And I just said, People, I'm, I'm planning to do an exhibition, so we had to come up instead of a rave to do an exhibition, but I, I want real people. I always wanted the, to engage the people who I'd interviewed before, and it's a very committed community. So I had said, this is just an idea. I just floated an idea, and people almost instantly started sending me images. So, you know, here you see, <laughs> I love them. I love them. They're, it's great. Anyway, so, you know, even before I had written my application to get this funding, I had all of these images and I thought, it's definitely an exhibition. It has to be an exhibition. So planning the exhibition is a different thing. So I sat down and I thought, okay, what's the purpose of my exhibition? 
I want to show an impact of rave culture that is beyond drug taking. Tick. I have achieved this with those images. But maybe I need to I need to kind of provide a narrative. I need to create a narrative around this for people to be able to to see this in context. Um, I had enough exhibits already after a week to, to do a small exhibition. Um, so I thought there's no more visual input needed from me and it's not my area of expertise anyway. So I just let the images of these ravers speak and I wanted them to provide captions that were no longer than 10 words. Um, shortly after, I was told that I got the ESRC funding and I thought I had plenty of time and then you find out there's never enough time. So I'd, um, I probably wanted to change the world in this time. And so th there were lots of things that I actually, that didn't materialize in the end. So the captions kind of out of the window. People wanted to tell their stories. I didn't have time to interview them, to actually turn them into proper interviews in which I had designed the questions. And, um, but also their budget implications. So as time runs out and there are only certain venues available and um, I was, I had, an, I had an idea where I wanted this exhibition to be because I thought I knew my audience. And what I knew is if, if I want to reach the public, it has to be outside the university. Nobody will come into my building, my particular building, to look at an, at an exhibition. So, but within the budgeting, I had to then go around to Manchester and look for particular venues and I wanted I didn't want a glitzy glam space. I wanted something that also represents rave culture. So I was looking for something a bit more rough and edgy. Um, but also, you know, I realized there are a lot of exhibitions going on in Manchester as I was kind of calling different venues, all the exhibition venues. There are plenty of exhibitions. So I thought I need to do something else to get people through the door. And in my case, it was a panel. Um, this panel was very interesting because originally I had managed to, to get Dave Heslam and to get John Robb and I was very excited because they're the big names of kind of music and culture in Manchester. And uh, the last one cancelled two days before the exhibition. Um, and I thought, what am I going to do now? The pan there's a panel advertised. Uh, mm. And then I, I just had people from that. I, I went back to Facebook and I said, I don't have a panel and people volunteered and sent me their CVs and said, I've done this and this and this and this and this. I think I can talk. And I thought, okay, we'll just do it with real people. That's the ho what, what the whole story is about. So we had a panel of real people who were very active in, 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 the, in the rave scene between kind of 85 and the 2000s. But I also had VoiceBot, which is something that I tried and most of my budget went for this. Um, VoiceBot, and you will see this in a minute, is, is basically like the size of a phone booth and it's computer assisted qualitative interviewing. So it's questions through a computer. People consent to being filmed. So on the top of the laptop, you have people being filmed and the questions are read out. So you have the cues as you watch the films, you have the cues of the questions and what questions they answer because they can also decide to skip. And we invited people into this kind of intimate space to answer questions. Originally, the idea was to give us feedback on the exhibition. And then we thought, well, if we have them in this space and if we manage to create the right atmosphere at this venue, we, we can tease out much more. So we spent a long time asked, kind of designing these questions and finding the right accent. And is it a man or a woman computer voice that asks those questions and all of these things. Um, and this is what we advertised. So the exhibition, it was the launch of the exhibition and at the launch we would have a panel discussion and we would also have voice box. And the, 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 the fact that it was so, unknown, so, so unknown what voice box is brought quite a few people through the door. Um, <clears throat> talked about outside the university. Um, in terms of budget, at some point we had to, we had to decide to, to go for lower quality prints because the money wasn't that great. I had 1,600 pounds to do that. Um, but then it goes back to what do we actually want to achieve? And if people come into an exhibition like mine, like th the one that I organized, I thought it's not about the quality of prints. I'm not attracting, I don't, the, the, the core audience is not an art audience that is interested in the quality. It's more what these pictures depict. So for as long as the pixelation is not too big, you know, we can live with this. And we, we didn't frame the pictures. We printed them on cardboard. 
um, but they kept the cost down. Um, and in the panel discussion, I had, I had interviewed, I had I'd met the, interview, uh, the, the panel before, and I had kind of given them a few cues along which I would like to chair this panel dis discussion that partly went back to my PhD, but it also had to do with, with evoking memories. Um, so the panel discussion really helped me to frame the whole event, but also to contextualize the exhibits. Mm, and um, it, as I said before, Voicebook it became, for me, and as part of this exhibition, a, a, a big thing. Not many people went in there, because some people really just wanted to look at the images, but some people really engaged. And these interviews, we thought, would last between eight to ten minutes. Now, some of them only lasted eight, but one lasted for an hour, and they just poured their heart out. And it's amazing that was for me the first time to see how, if, if it's not me as an academic who, who asked the question, but a computer, people take more time to think about their answers, and people are also, at times, I think, more honest. Um, we also asked people to write down memories on postcards because I really thought if I want this event to work for my future life and higher education, um, I, I want to have something to be able to work with after the event. So it's never just an event for and of itself. It always has to lead to something else. It needs to, it needs to inform my narrative. Um, and something else that I've that I've learned in the process of this, and I now do all the time, is you have to document your success. Th you know, it doesn't exist if you can't show that you've done it. So we got somebody in to take pictures, we got somebody in, in to film the panel discussion, just so that afterwards I could, you know, I could show that this is what happened and what the response was. So here you see a few images um, of the exhibition. So those were the images that went up on the wall, they were about this size. Um, here they are on the wall. These are two panel members. So this is a famous dancer at the Haciendas who used to be a, the, the kind of house dancer at the same spot. Um, a famous club night organizer. He did herbal tea parties. Here you see the flyers that we designed that went out. Um, this here, this little one is, is the voice box. So it's really just a tiny space. And what you see in there is a small desk, a chair and the laptop and a speaker so that people could hear themselves properly. And outside the voice box was this kind of relaxed, you know, creating a relaxed atmosphere for people to be invited in. Um, here you see the postcards that were also hanging in the exhibition for the days after. Um, something that I hadn't prepared for, somebody suddenly came with a camera in my face. And I, I, I don't think I've ever stuttered that much. And that wasn't subsequently actually broadcast at that interview. I think I did a really bad job, but I've learned. Okay. Um, and then this happened, serendipity. Um, something um, appeared uh, at the online Manchester Evening News before the exhibition. And it's, it's worth sticking with this for a bit because they pulled out stuff that I never thought they would tag on. And it shows that some things I did right and some things I didn't quite get. So the, the, the caption is, lecturer uses Hacienda clubbing memories as inspiration for a new Northern Quarter exhibition. We had chosen the Northern Quarter purposefully for this exhibition. Um, it was uh, downstairs in a bar, in a room, very shabby, very, not dirty, but rough. <laughs> and we chose this for a purpose. And I think we, we made the right choice because it was picked up on because, you know, Northern Quarter back then was still a little bit cool. Um, but then, Hacienda clubbing memories. I never ever talked about the Hacienda because the whole point of the exhibition was real people, real memories, and not the, the kind of public perception of, of what nightlife at those times in Manchester was. So not once did I mention the Hacienda. They got this all wrong, but they clearly need something that everybody else can refer to. And this is my big learning curve. I can't just sit in my little niche and think, other people are interested automatically. I have to, it's in a similar way to, to using visuals. You know, I have, to, I have to use it in a format or with a method that is understood by, by people outside my field. Um, and then also has turned her experience, I'm too young. <laughs> I actually, I wasn't even in the country when the Hacienda was open. 
But I thought, will I write to them? Of course I won't, because what happened then is the Mirror, it's the Guardian, it's, it's various online resources, and that all happened within a day. And I, oh, it was amazing, but it <laughs> also a nightmare. So the only interview I, I ever gave was to the Guardian, and everything else is either copied or a lie. I mean, there's so many wrong facts in there, fake news. But then, of course, as a researcher, if you think about impact, <laughs> I don't care. Great. <laughs> so, OK. And then I thought, hmm, maybe I do have a career in academia. It's happening. <laughs> so and th when you then are able to step back from this, you, have, you, you think organizing the exhibition is one thing, but what you make of the exhibition is something else, how you make the exhibition work for you. So I wanted the public engagement I had. It was sold out. It had great um, feedback, the exhibition. But then one of the things that I learned is about advertising and promotion and self-promotion. So, you know, to, to, to feel confident enough to speak about what you're doing to other people without excusing your research area, your subject area, your method, your approach, but just being confident enough to promote that and say, I've done good work and to believe in it. Uh, I had to learn that that wasn't the beginning, especially after the feedback from my papers. Um, but I was, I, I was, I knew that from then on, whatever I do now, data collection is a process, is something that has to be part of whatever I do. So even if it is a public event, there has to be some sort of capturing something that I can work with afterwards. It has to kind of be self-perpetuating in a way. The dissemination of findings, um, I did have to think, and I'm still thinking about this all the time, what I do and how I engage the public has to lead to publications. If it doesn't do them, then as an academic, I haven't fulfilled my, my role. So even as part of the exhibition, and I, I did my PhD in the humanities, I've moved over to the social sciences, so really a portfolio where an exhibition is part of it doesn't really work. But writing about an exhibition, I have to think about my output, I have to think about which aspects I want to write about and can actually, I, I can turn into papers. Um, the public engagement, as I said before, it's an amazing community and there are lots of volunteers in this community, they, they still keep coming forward. So the question then was for me, where from here? So I did the exhibition, was successful, I got my you know, first ever bit of money, um, and I got great feedback, and then I thought, okay, let's just try. So I applied for funding to the Heritage Lottery, and I call this the Labs Clubber Heritage Map. It's a, it's a collaboration with Manchester Digital Music Archive, so that's my, my, my kind of history association uh, uh, collaboration. I need a heritage organization to do that. Um, and it, it kind of, this project ticks all the boxes and I was aware of this when I wrote the funding application. It still took me half a year to write this. Um, but what's happened since, because there, I had a certain reach through the exhibition and I wanted to keep it going, is there have been interviews, there have been co podcasts, there has been consultancy, something that I had never anticipated. Um, and also for the first time as an academic, I'm in a position where I have to choose my level of engagement. So, you know, there are people who approach me or want to collaborate and I have to say I don't have the time or the scope or it doesn't really fit what I'm doing at the moment. But equally, people have come forward and said, I've got this idea, are you up for it? And I'm thinking, that sounds amazing, that sounds great, it's, it's right up my street, it will really help me um, to achieve what I want to achieve with this project. And it is really capturing events, emotions and memories between 85 and 95. So at the end of the project, there will be an online map where people can submit audio on written form, their memories. It will be screened before it goes live, but it is the idea is that it becomes a self-perpetuating um, kind of history that gets written over the years. Um, and of course, now I'm in a position where I'm thinking, okay, I'm halfway through the project, what's next? So, so the idea of the exhibition is really, it shouldn't ever mark the end of something, although it might be the end of something, of a research project, but it can, at best of times, also present the beginning of something. 
And I think if I, if I were to go back today, I didn't think it back then. I maybe would have done some things differently. It just happened that it, that it worked out. But from now on, whenever I think about the next step, it's, it's the kind of how does it fit in into the bigger planning. So ideally, I know where I am in five years and what helps me to get there. But I had to learn it through the exhibition. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the exhibition. Applause